Poincaré. The genesis of mathematical discovery is a problem which must inspire the psychologist with the keenest interest. For this is the process in which the human mind seems to borrow lease from the exterior world, in which it acts, or appears to act, only by itself and on itself, so that by studying the process of geometric thought we may hope to arrive at what is most essential in the human mind. One first fact must astonish us, or rather would astonish us if we were not too much accustomed to it. How does it happen that there are people who do not understand mathematics? If the science invokes only the rules of logic, those accepted by all well-formed minds, if its evidence is founded on principles that are common to all men, and that none but a madman would attempt to deny, how does it happen that there are so many people who are entirely impervious to it? There is nothing mysterious in the fact that everyone is not capable of discovery, that everyone should not be able to retain a demonstration he has once learned is still comprehensible. But what does seem most surprising when we consider it is that anyone should be unable to understand a mathematical argument at the very moment it is stated to him. And yet those who can only follow the argument with difficulty are in a majority. This is incontestable, and the experience of teachers of secondary education will certainly not contradict me. And still further, how is error possible in mathematics? A healthy intellect should not be guilty of any error in logic, and yet there are very keen minds which will not make a false step in a short argument such as those we have to make in the ordinary actions of life, which yet are incapable of following or repeating without error the demonstrations of mathematics which are longer but which are, after all, only accumulations of short arguments exactly analogous to those they make so easily. Is it necessary to add that mathematicians themselves are not infallible? The answer appears to me obvious. Imagine a long series of syllogisms in which the conclusions of those that proceed from the premises of those that follow. We shall be capable of grasping each of the syllogisms and it is not in the passage from premises to conclusion that we are in danger of going astray, but between the moment when we meet a proposition for the first time as the conclusion of one syllogism, and the moment when we find it once more as the premise of another syllogism. Much time will sometimes have elapsed, and we shall have unfolded many links of the chain. Accordingly, it may well happen that we shall have forgotten it, or what is more serious, forgotten its meaning. So we may chance to replace it by a somewhat different proposition, or to preserve the same statement, but give it a slightly different meaning, and thus we are in danger of falling into error. A mathematician must use a rule, and naturally he begins by demonstrating the rule. At the moment the demonstration is quite fresh in his memory and he understands it perfectly, its meaning and significance, and he is in no danger of changing it. But later on he commits it to memory, only applies it in a mechanical way, and then if his memory fails him, he may apply it wrongly. It is thus to take a simple and almost vulgar example that we sometimes make mistakes in calculation because we have forgotten our multiplication table. On this view, special aptitude for mathematics would be due to nothing but a very certain memory or a tremendous power of attention. It would be a quality analogous to that of the whist player who can remember the cards played or to rise a step higher to that of the chess player who can picture a very great number of combinations and retain them in his memory. Every good mathematician should also be a good chess player and vice versa. 
and similarly he should be a good numerical calculator. Certainly this sometimes happens and thus Gauss was at once a geometrician of a genius and a very precocious and very certain calculator. But there are exceptions, or rather I am wrong, for I cannot call them exceptions, otherwise exceptions would be more numerous than the cases of conformity with the rule. On the contrary, it was Gauss who was an exception. As for myself, I must confess I am absolutely incapable of doing an addition sum without a mistake. Similarly, I should be a very bad chess player. I could easily calculate that by playing in a certain way I should be exposed to such and such a danger. I should then review many other moves which I should reject for other reasons, and I should end by making the move I first examined. Having forgotten in the interval the danger I had foreseen. In a word, my memory is not bad, but it would be insufficient to make me a good chess player. Why then does it not fail me in a difficult mathematical argument in which the majority of chess players would be lost? Clearly, because it is guided by the general trend of the argument. The mathematical demonstration is not a simple juxtaposition of syllogisms. It consists of syllogisms placed in a certain order, and the order in which these elements are placed is much more important than the elements themselves. If I have the feeling, so to speak, the intuition of this order, so that I can perceive the whole of the argument at a glance, I need no longer be afraid of forgetting one of the elements. Each of them will place themselves naturally in the position prepared for it, without my having to make any effort of memory. It seems to me, then, as I repeat an argument I have learned, that I could have discovered it. This is often only an illusion, but even then, if I am not clever enough to create for myself, I rediscover it myself as I repeat it. We can understand that this feeling, this intuition of mathematical order, which enables us to guess hidden harmonies and relations, cannot belong to everyone. Some have neither this delicate feeling that is difficult to define, nor a power of memory and attention above the common, and so they are absolutely incapable of understanding even the first steps of higher mathematics. This applies to the majority of people. Others have the feeling only in a slight degree, but they are gifted with an uncommon memory and a great capacity for attention. They learn the details, one after the other, by heart. They can understand mathematics and sometimes apply them, but they are not in a condition to create. Lastly, others possess the special intuition I've spoken of more or less highly developed, and they can not only understand mathematics, even though their memory is in no way extraordinary, but they can become creators and seek to make a discovery with more or less chance of success, according as their intuition is more or less developed. What in fact is mathematical discovery? It does not consist in making new combinations with mathematical entities that are already known. They can be done by anyone and the combinations that could be so formed would be infinite in number, and the greater part of them would be absolutely devoid of interest. Discovery consists precisely in not constructing useless combinations, but in constructing those that are useful, which are an infinitely small minority. Discovery is discernment, selection. How this selection is to be made, I've explained above. Mathematical facts worthy of being studied are those which by their analogy with other facts are capable of conducting us to knowledge of a mathematical law in the same way that experimental facts conduct us to the knowledge of a physical law. They are those which reveal unsuspected relationships between other facts along since known but wrongly believed to be unrelated to each other. Among the combinations we choose, 
The most fruitful are often those which are formed of elements borrowed from widely separated domains. I do not mean to say that for discovery it is sufficient to bring together objects that are incongruous as possible. The greater part of the combinations so formed would be entirely fruitless, but some among them, though very rare, are the most fruitful of all. Discovery, as I have said, is selection, but this is perhaps not quite the right word. It suggests a purchaser who has been shown a large number of samples and examines them one after the other in order to make his selection. In our case, the samples would be so numerous that a whole life would not give sufficient time to examine them. Things do not happen in this way. Unfruitful combinations do not so much as present themselves to the mind of the discoverer. In the field of his consciousness, there never appear any but really useful combinations, and some that he rejects, which, however, partake to some extent of the character of useful combinations. Everything happens as if the discoverer were a secondary examiner who had only to interrogate candidates declared eligible after passing a preliminary test. But what I have said up to now is only what can be observed or inferred by reading the works of geometricians, provided they are read with some reflection. It is time to penetrate further and to see what happens in the very soul of the mathematician. For this purpose, I think I cannot do better than recount my personal recollections. Only I am going to confine myself to relating how I wrote my first treatise on Fuchsian functions. I must apologize, for I am going to introduce some technical expressions, but they need not alarm the reader, for he has no need to understand them. I shall say, for instance, that I found the demonstration of such and such a theorem under such and such circumstances. The theorem will have a barbarous name that many will not know, but that is of no importance. What is interesting for the psychologist is not the theorem, but the circumstances. For a fortnight I had been attempting to prove that there could not be any function analogous to what I have since called Fuchsian functions. I was at that time very ignorant. Every day I sat down at my table and spent an hour or two trying a great number of combinations, and I arrived at no result. One night, I took some black coffee, contrary to my custom, and was unable to sleep. A host of ideas kept surging in my mind. I could almost feel them jostling one another, until two of them coalesced, so to speak, to form a stable combination. When morning came, I had established the existence of one class of Fuchsian function, those that are derived from the hypergeometric series. I had only to verify the results, which only took a few hours. Then I wished to represent these functions by the quotient of two series. This idea was perfectly conscious and deliberate. I was guided by the analogy with the elliptical functions. I asked myself what must be the properties of these series if they existed, and I succeeded without a difficulty in forming the series that I have called Theta Fuchsian. At that moment, I left Sain, where I was then living, to take part in a geological conference arranged by the School of Mines. The incidents of the journey made me forget my mathematical work. When we arrived at Coutances, we got into a break to go for a drive, and just as I put my foot on the step, the idea came to me, though nothing in my former thoughts seemed to have prepared me for it, that the transformations I had used to define Fuchsian functions were identical with those of non-Euclidean geometry. I made no verification and had no time to do so, since I took up the conversation again as soon as I sat down in the break. But I felt absolutely certainty at once. When I got back to Seine, I verified the result at my leisure to satisfy my conscience. I then began to study arithmetical questions 
without any great apparent result and without suspecting that they could have the least connection with my previous researches. Disgusted at my want of success, I went away to spend a few days at the seaside and thought entirely of different things. One day, as I was walking on the cliff, the idea came to me again with the same characteristics of conciseness, suddenness, and immediate certainty that arithmetical transformations of indefinite ternary quadratic forms are identical with those of non-Euclidean geometry. Returning to Sain, I reflected on this result and deduced its consequences. The example of quadratic forms showed me that there are Fuchsian groups other than those which correspond with the hypergeometric series. I saw that I could apply to them the theory of the theta Fuchsian series, and that consequently there are Fuchsian functions other than those which are derived from the hypergeometric series, the only ones I knew up to that time. Naturally, I proposed to form all these functions. I laid siege to them systematically and captured all the outworks one after the other. There was one, however, which still held out, whose fall would carry with it that of the central fortress. But all my efforts were of no avail at first, except to make me better understand the difficulty which was already something. All this work was perfectly conscious. Thereupon I left for Mont Valerien, where I had to serve my time in the army and so my mind was preoccupied with very different matters. One day as I was crossing the street, the solution of the difficulty which had brought me to a standstill came to me all at once. I did not try to fathom it immediately, and it was only after my service was finished that I returned to the question. I had all the elements and had only to assemble and arrange them. Accordingly, I composed my definitive treaties at a sitting and without any difficulty. It is useless to multiply examples, and I will content myself with this one alone. As regards my other researches, the accounts I should give would be exactly similar, and the observations related by other mathematicians in the inquiry of l'assignement mathématique would only confirm them. One is at once struck by these appearances of sudden illumination, obvious indications of a long course of previous unconscious work. The part delayed by this unconscious work in mathematical discovery seems to me indisputable, and we shall find traces of it in other cases where it is less evident. Often when a man is working at a difficult question, he accomplishes nothing the first time he sets to work. Then he takes more or less of a rest and sits down again at his table. During the first half hour, he still finds nothing, and then all at once the decisive idea presents itself to his mind. We might say that the conscious work proved more fruitful because it was interrupted and the rest restored force and freshness to the mind. One is at once struck by these appearances of sudden illumination, obvious indications of a long course of previous unconscious work. The part delayed by this unconscious work in mathematical discovery seems to me indisputable, and we shall find traces of it in other cases where it is less evident. Often when a man is working at a difficult question, he accomplishes nothing the first time he sets to work. Then he takes more or less of a rest, and sits down again at his table. During the first half hour, he still finds nothing, and then all at once the decisive idea presents itself to his mind. We might say that the conscious work proved more fruitful because it was interrupted, and the rest restored force and freshness to the mind. But it is more probable that the rest was occupied with unconscious work, and that the result of this work was afterwards revealed to the geometrician exactly as in the cases I have quoted, except that the revelation, instead of coming to light during a walk or a journey, 
came during a period of conscious work. But independently of that work, which at most only performs the unlocking process, as if it were the spur that excited into conscious form the results already acquired during the rest, which till then remained unconscious. There is another remark to be made regarding the conditions of the unconscious work, which is that it is not possible, or in any case not fruitful, unless it is first preceded and then followed by a period of conscious work. These sudden inspirations are never produced, and this is sufficiently proved already by the examples I have quoted, except after some days of voluntary effort which appeared absolutely fruitless, in which one thought one had accomplished nothing, and seemed to be on a totally wrong track. These efforts, however, were not as barren as one thought. They set the unconscious machine in motion, and without them it would not have worked at all, and would not have produced anything. Such are the facts of the case, and they suggest the following reflections. The result of all the proceeds is to show that the unconscious ego, or as it is called the subliminal ego, plays a most important part in mathematical discovery but the subliminal ego is generally thought of as purely automatic. Now we have seen that the mathematical work is not a simple mechanical work, that it could not be entrusted to any machine. Whatever the degree of perfection we suppose it to have been brought to, it is not merely a question of applying certain rules, of manufacturing as many combinations as possible according to a certain fixed law. The combinations so obtained would be extremely numerous, useless, and encumbering. The real work of the discovery consists in choosing between these combinations with a view to eliminating those that are useless, or rather not giving himself the trouble of making them at all. The rules which must guide this choice are extremely subtle and delicate, and it is practically impossible to state them in a precise language. They must be felt rather than formulated. Under these conditions, how can we imagine a sieve capable of applying them mechanically? The following, then, presents itself as a first hypothesis. The subliminal ego is in no way inferior to the conscious ego. It is not purely automatic. It is capable of discernment. It has tact and lightness of touch. It can select and it can divine. More than that, it can divine better than the conscious ego, since it succeeds where the latter fails. In a word, is not the subliminal ego superior to the conscious ego? The importance of this question will be readily understood. In a recent lecture, M. Boutreau showed how it had arisen in entirely different occasions, and what consequences would be involved by an answer in the affirmative? Are we forced to give this affirmative answer by the facts I have just stated? I confess that, for my part, I should be loth to accept it. Let us then return to the facts and see if they do not admit of some other explanation. It is certain that the combinations which present themselves to the mind in a kind of sudden illumination after a somewhat prolonged period of unconscious work are generally useful and fruitful combinations, which appear to be the result of a preliminary sifting. Does it follow from this that the subliminal ego, having divined by delicate intuition that these combinations could be useful, has formed none but these, or has it formed a great many others, which were devoid of interest and remained unconscious. Under this second aspect, all the combinations are formed as a result of the automatic action of the subliminal ego. But these only, which are interesting, find their way into the field of consciousness. This too is most mysterious. How can we explain the fact that, of the thousand products of our unconscious activity, some are invited to cross the threshold, while others remain outside. 
Is it mere chance that gives this, this privilege? Evidently not. For instance, of all the excitements of our senses, it is only the most intense that retain our intention, unless it has been directed upon them by other causes. More commonly, the privileged unconscious phenomena, those that are capable of becoming conscious, are those which directly or indirectly most deeply affect our sensibility. It may appear surprising that sensibility should be introduced in connection with mathematical demonstrations, which it would seem can only interest the intellect, but not if we bear in mind the feeling of mathematical beauty, of the harmony of numbers and forms, and of geometric elegance. It is a real aesthetic feeling that all true mathematicians recognize, and this is truly sensibility. Now. What are the mathematical entities to which we attribute this character of beauty and elegance, which are capable of developing in us a kind of aesthetic emotion? Those whose elements are harmoniously arranged so that the mind can, without effort, take in the whole without neglecting the details. This harmony is at once a satisfaction to our aesthetic requirements and an assistance to the mind which it supports and guides. At the same time, by setting before our eyes a well-ordered whole, it gives us a presentment of mathematical law. Now, as I have said above, the only mathematical facts worthy of retaining our attention and capable of being useful are those which can make us acquainted with the mathematical law. Accordingly, we arrive at the following conclusion. The useful combinations are precisely the most beautiful. I mean those that can most charm that special sensibility that all mathematicians know, but of which laymen are so ignorant that they are often tempted to smile at it. This was Mathematical Discovery by Henri Poincaré.